As we inch closer to the 2020 Democratic primary, a new book series seeks to give voters an unbiased insight into each candidate. Meet the Candidates, a voter's guide, dives into each contender's credentials, their campaign issues, the challenges, and their chances to win the race. Joining us to explain the importance of this series and what went into compiling it is the co-founder and lead investigator of the Democratic Coalition, Scott Dworkin. He is the series editor. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for having me on. Um, so how, just like on the mechanics, how are these guides put together? What can people expect to find inside of them? Well, I write the introduction to them, and I have a lot of personal experience with the, the different candidates, and so mm -hmm. I cite that at the beginning, and then we go over the biography of the candidate and their policy positions, and we make sure that we review everything that they've done in their past so that we don't run into uh, no and surprises. Unvetted. Yeah, yeah. Sure. like in 2016 where we had some problems where we did not fully vet all candidates running. So your, your stated goal, you know, your organization, you want to defeat Donald Trump. And I know you're not going to take a position, but what are the characteristics that you're looking for to highlight in the book that of a Democratic candidate that can defeat Donald Trump in 2020? Well, I think somebody has got to be universally loved. Like they can't be a person who has a lot of people from the Hillary campaign that are against them or uh, people from the left, a uh, progressive wing of the party that are against them, you know, Bernie supporters, somebody that can unite the party. God, and is also, that possible? I was going to say, I, I don't know if <laughs> that person exists. Who is this magical exists. unicorn? I, I, they'll, have to, they'll, have to, they'll, have to, they'll have to figure it out. Like, somebody's going to have to unite us. And yeah. now I think that President Obama is going to have a, a, a lot of, to do with that. And, and you'll see him campaign at a level that... It, it seems like he's running in 2020. Isn't Trump, though, honestly the great uniter on the Democratic side? I mean, no matter how I feel about any of the candidates, and I have some strong feelings about some of them, like, right. whoever gets through the Democratic primary, I'm going to be all in for because it's all hands on deck to take this guy out. He, he is. I, I think that what's important, what, what we've learned probably from campaigns, is that uh, we don't, we don't want to use just him. We can't do that. We can't win that way. We can't just use it. But he is a great way to unite. Um, and, and so there's a lot of divisiveness. We just need to be able to overcome that by saying, yeah, he says this, but here's what we stand for. Here's what we want to actually do. Here's what we want to accomplish, and here's how we're different. And that's why we want you to vote for us. But the real, I mean, the real battle is over how do we want to accomplish. It's about the theory of change within the Democratic Party. You kind of have the incrementalist change advocated by Joe Biden, and then you have the kind of uh, revolutionary, you know, burn down the system or at least overhaul the entire system right. between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. How do you view those coming together in the 2020 primary? Is it possible that the Trump campaign will just be able to stoke both and then keep? You'll, you'll, you'll basically get to the general election, you'll have Democrats who have slogged it out, and it could actually make his election chances even better. Right, I, it, it can. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, I, I like how there's so many candidates running because there's so many national voices now for Democrats, um, but there is going to have to be a ticket that molds them both together, because it can't just be a person who's uh, completely progressive and doesn't, you know, isn't able to get independents on board. Um, you, you've got to have that universal view and, and be able to explain that to the American people because some people are so turned off by what's happening right now in Washington that they don't want to pay attention to things. And that's why we wrote the book in the first place uh -huh. is to explain, you know, these people are really accomplished. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot more to them than catchphrases and, uh, you know, derogatory terms or hits against them. And so we want to make sure that we explain that with the positives and negatives in the book um, because a lot of them have some baggage uh, as well but we want to make sure that people are fully exposed so they don't they don't make any assumptions just based on what uh, Trump tweets or you know based on what somebody says in the primary you know a, a hit in the debate or, or anything like that or one sound bite and so it's I think it's going to be important to make sure that everybody is on the same page when we do have that nominee uh, so if it's if it's Joe Biden, whether it's Warren or Harris uh, or Sanders, it, it doesn't matter. That person's going to need to unite, and they're going to need to ride a little bit to the center. And this is a true progressive saying that, but that's just the the truth. Because otherwise, it will boost uh, Donald Trump's chances. Well, you and I have known each other for a while, and right. you've worked in politics for a long time. You're an right. excellent researcher. That's one of the things that you're really known for, is some right. of the nuggets that you've turned up on Donald Trump in particular. But what did you find in doing, turning sort of that lens of research to the Democratic side? What have you found that surprised you? Uh, I, you know, the word socialism is really despised in this country, and so that's one of the things that 
was it was kind of shocking to me. I, I wasn't sure that it was that it was viewed that negatively. Well, what do you mean by that? Based on polling that you it was, So there, it was it was based on, I think it was Pew that did the, uh. the poll on it, but yes, it, it was research. Um, where How do you the, square that though with the fact that Bernie Sanders has one of the highest favorability ratings in the Democratic primary? Uh, I think that he, he's gonna have to change what the term is, uh, and so he won't use the word socialism, maybe he'll call it Bernieism or something along those lines, mm -hmm. um, but he, I think because he overrides the word socialism, he's not, he's more than just that, he's Bernie Sanders. Gotcha, interesting. Yeah. And what about, I mean, in terms of policy positions, in right. terms of background, anything there that people would might, might not know off the top of their head? I think Mayor Pete was surprisingly conservative, much more conservative than I had expected. Huh. There's a lot of different gaffes that he had, um, the one being, you know, he said all lives matter at one point. Um, and then, you know, he supported the police force over a brutality case. And, and so there's a couple things like that. Uh, also, Biden, there's a lot of video from the past, and, and that's going to come back to haunt him mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, with Senator Harris, uh, she has a lot in her background that I involves family ties and, and also um, her getting appointed to things with people she's she's been romantically involved with. or. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of, and Senator Warren being very conservative, uh, I guess she'd be liberal to today's standard, but back in the day used to be a very, very conservative uh -huh. uh, Republican. And so. Well, Mayor Pete in particular has escaped a lot of the national scrutiny. Right. And, and yeah. you're right, it's only now that we're looking at South Bend's housing policies, which right. disproportionately affected African Americans mm -hmm. who lived in South Bend, that police brutality case that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. All of these are things on such a local microcosmic scale, but it's all we have to judge him on. Right. And so what, what other conser like conservative actions have you seen him uh, seen from his background? Well, those are, those are the main ones that yeah. You, we focused on in the book. Um, he's, I think, talking when he, when he talks to people and tries to uh, divide the lines. It, it's hard because you can't always come up with something that you agree on that everybody agrees on. Sometimes you have to pick a side. You can't just mold them all together. And I think you'll see him face that challenge uh, because he. he talks in very general strokes and when people want to pin him down as he gains in the polls, I think you'll see the scrutiny kind of turned up on him. Yeah. We, we learned the uh, debate lineups uh, on Friday, <laughs> you know, and it, I mean, most of the big players are on the second night. You've right. got Biden and Bernie and Harris and Buttigieg all on the second night. And then you've got um, a Warren kind of in terms of a front runner, kind of on her own the first night. I mean, putting your pundit prognosticator hat on, how do you think those dynamics play out? Who do you think they benefit? I think, well, Senator Warren, she's going to set the tone. Right, um, but it also is an opportunity for people on th that debate stage to stand out, and then you know, depending on what's said that night, they'll take it up a notch the next night. So it's going to depend. It, it's kind of it, it's better for the, some of those candidates to be on the second night. Um, with Senator Warren, I think she's happy to be up first, and I think the, the spotlight will be solely on her to start. Hmm. But then some people might break free. Yeah, That's I think that Biden Bernie matchup is going to be. Yeah, I know. would still love to see Marquee. Warren on that stage. Right. With all oh, of them. I, I would be great. That's all. I just want those, those we'll six. We'll That's get all there. I want. <laughs> uh, another final question for you, Scott, on impeachment. And this is what I'm very curious. All of these candidates have taken different stances on impeachment. Through your research, what do you think? that impeachment is, how successful will it make you to call for impeachment in this primary? Mm. Is it like a necessary part of becoming a Democratic candidate in 2020? I think if you're a progressive uh, running for office, absolutely. If you want to get the progressive base, then that's an, another thing. As people learn how long impeachment would take and the fact that I impeachment doesn't mean removal from office, I think people are going to start to pull back from it. It's a knee-jerk reaction. Um, but you know, it's inching closer and closer to impeachment because all roads lead to impeachment. All these investigations lead to impeachment. Everything that's being done right now leads to impeachment. Um, but, you know, whether or not um, Speaker Pelosi in the caucus makes that decision, there's only 64 members of Congress that support uh, impeachment at this moment, and we don't even have the full caucus, not even half of the caucus. And so until then, I don't think that you'll see people use it as a main talking point. Um, it will be a rallying cry more so than anything else. And yeah. as time goes on, if, if we're like a year out, you'll hear people say less about 
uh, impeachment and more about voting him out of office. Interesting. Really interesting. Scott, great to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on Rising, his ordeal became a rallying cry for prison reform advocates, and now the Meek Mill crime bill is being picked up across the country, including in the great state of Pennsylvania. Two of the bill's champions explain what the measure entails and how the legislation inspired by the rapper would significantly change the parole system when Rising returns.